It is great to be here. Uh, I've obviously come quite a long way. Um, and I actually lived in Montreal about five years ago for six months. So it's just wonderful to be back. It's a beautiful city and a fantastic location for the conference. How's that distance there? Um, now, I've been drawing maps since I was a kid, but really focused, focused on it since Montreal, actually, five years ago. And the last three years, I've been drawing a large pictorial map of North America in pencil. Uh, much of what I've learned has come through this piece. Now, along with being a lover of maps and geography, it's the distinct characteristics of a place that inspire me. What does a place feel like? No amount of research or street view can tell you that. A place engages all the senses in its own charismatic way. What does a place sound like? How do these characteristics of place impact our work as cartographers, as artists? Uh, so today I'll be sharing some technical advice on how I actually draw these maps, uh, then talk a bit about exploring the place you're mapping from afar using the senses as a guide. I'll share a few experiences I've had diving into, uh, for example, the music of a focus region. It is fun, inspiring, and it assists the creative process. Uh, like any worthwhile journey, you do not know what you'll find. But onto the drawing. Um, Hand-drawn maps are not so common anymore. After all, maps are beautiful pieces of art, but they're there for more than just looking pretty. They have function. Of all the artistic-leaning fields out there, cartography is one that screams for powerful software. It requires precision, the processing of a lot of data, and maps are looking more beautiful than ever in the digital age. But still, to this day, we love hand-drawn maps. They have aesthetic qualities that are desirable, but it's more than that. It's the rich, ancient tradition of making them by hand. We've only had digital tools over the last few decades, yet they've been made by hand for millennia. So, even for the modern map maker, uneasy about picking up a pencil, doing so in any capacity connects you to the roots of the craft. Now, tools for research and inquiry are more powerful today than anyone imagined a short time ago. And these tools benefit the traditional creator just as much as the digital. Yes, you still have to spend a lot of time drawing, but boundless information is at your fingertips at all times. The notion that hand-drawn maps have seen their day is unwise because it's easier to research and prep them than it has ever been. Better tools equals better maps, period. Now, let's get into the studio here. Um, this is how it looks when I'm working away in my studio in Melbourne. Um, I like to draw vertically and mostly behind that magnifying lamp there. It makes all the difference for detail and spares my eyes for the long run. Um, I much prefer to stand up and draw, uh, but for the southern third of the North American continent map, I have to sit due to the ceiling height at my house. Uh, so I try to stretch as much as possible. Um, I've always got two screens up for reference material and a central spot for my main tools, which are a level ruler, an electric eraser, eraser guard, and an X-Acto knife. Um, the electric eraser and guard combo is amazing. You can isolate exactly what you want to uh, erase and just blitz it away. If the pupil in the eye of a frog is a little bit off-center, just isolate it and it's gone. <laughs> um, I mostly use pencil, HBs and color. Uh, they are unbeatable for detail and uh, precision. Paint is beautiful for rich colour, as great painter cartographers like Buran demonstrate. But fine pencil is great for a detailed map. I tend to use very hard leads, all in the H range. Uh, 6H and 7H are my favourite. I'm not quite sure the US pencil grade system, but let's just say those are extremely hard leads. Um, and I quite like the state Lamar's Lumograph. Now for colour pencil, the North American continent has been drawn using the Derwent Studio set. There's 72 colours in the strip, so plenty of potential for nice blending. And they've got hard leads that sharpen to a fine point easily, uh, rarely crumble. Of course, sharpening properly is critical. Um, after a little use, my pencils start to look a bit like this. They get pretty dangerous. I didn't even want to bring them over through TSA. <laughs> but for precision and crisp detail, no pencil is too sharp. Um, 6 and 7H being such hard leads, if you use a knife and sandpaper, you can get crazy fine tips. Uh, just find an X-Acto knife that suits you and use your thumb to guide the slice. Go nice and long. Um, and once you have the uh, length you need, sand them off on one of these sandpaper blocks. Uh, most, art supply so most art supply stores sell both of these items, but you can always make a contraption yourself. Medium to fine grade sandpaper is perfect for graphite, 
while a rougher grade suits colour. This is how you get very sharp tips on colour pencil, and a sharp colour pencil is a powerful thing. Uh, this is very important for line work and for cityscapes. Of course, there's over 600 cityscapes on this single map here, and um, each of them have got detail that's unique to the location. Now, some folks prefer freehand lines and some like rulers. It makes for a wildly different effect depending on which you choose, so I recommend you make that decision early on in the process. Personally, I'm a big fan of rulers, and buildings in real life do tend to be made up of straight level lines. Uh, so for realism, this is worth considering. Now, one issue with rulers is getting nice parallel and perpendicular lines, but if you're working upright like I do, using a level is a great way to get around this. I, tend to use, I used to use a big builder's level as I couldn't find one small enough that had a level on it, but eventually I just glued one to my chosen ruler and never looked back. <laughs> just make sure it's aligned and it'll work great. Um, now, most of the buildings on my map are actually flush with one another. It gives some order within a single cityscape and across the wide expanse of the map. Uh, from day one, I, wanted to, I decided to make all of my city labels level with each other, even on the highly oblique corners. I wanted each city to have some common alignment, make them feel like analogous nodes in a network. Uh, just be sure to first draw a master level mark somewhere blank on the piece of paper so that you can realign it if the paper shifts or check if your level is still calibrated. Um, now, labels, as we all know, tell you much more than a name. Uh, several layers of information can be carried in a label. Size, style, colour placement. Uh, I love population-based hierarchy of city labels. In starting the North American continent, I made a seven-tier label guide for city population. Let's zoom in a little there. Uh, I chose to use MSAs for the US. That's the Metropolitan Statistical Area definition. It suited the large scale of my projection. I scan the continent for heavily urban regions like Greater Mexico City, the Northeast United States, places I'd have most trouble with space. I decided to include every city that would fit uh, with a metro area greater than 100,000, making exceptions, of course, for small capitals and some very isolated towns. Uh, north in Canada, Alaska and Greenland, I dropped the inclusion cap to 1,000 to correct for a smaller population outside of the lower 10% of Canada. Um, the idea was to have a master guide for each population bracket and then size every city label according to that guide. I'd just rule the level box at those dimensions and uh, write the label at that size. It hasn't quite worked out how I'd hoped, however. When I started this map back in 2014, I underestimated the room that I'd have and went too big. I never underestimate how little space you have in cartography. Uh, it forced my city labels to gradually shrink as I tackled increasing density um, but despite this issue, I've tried to stick to the general principle. Oh, and choose your population grading widely. See where you can get the best spreads, uh, because every level has a certain character. I wish instead of jumping from one to three million, I'd graduated at two million. There are many more of these cities than the three to five, so I could have had a more dynamic population hierarchy. This issue with shrinking labels demonstrates a major thing to consider with hand-drawn maps, um, especially larger pieces. You must attempt, actually all maps I would say, you must attempt to anticipate the evolution of your map and your skills. What are you likely to know by the time you're halfway through? Which brings me to pen. Um, while I use pencil 98% of the time now, pen plays a crucial role, especially with labels. I have a red for political borders and labels, uh, a blue for water labels, and a brown for some land features like island names. Um, these all have half millimetre nibs, while the Copic I use for city labels, the black one there, is an extremely fine 0.03 millimetre. Uh, but I have a fractious relationship with pen. In earlier times, I used fine liners everywhere. You know, they're sharp and bold, and I like that you could pencil something in, get it perfect, then apply pen and erase the pencil underneath. It's like training wheels. Borders, watersheds, labels, outlines of buildings. Pen locks them in boldly and permanently. But it's when mistakes happen. A mislabel, a spelling error, a border that blocks a city. Still, you can be super careful, and as cartographers, we tend to be. Uh, the real issue I've had with pen is that, again, I didn't anticipate the evolution of my map or my skills. I locked in content that aged uh, badly. Remember, pen is permanent, sort of. Uh, well, I strongly urge you to always view it that way, but if you're on medium to heavy paper, you can remove fine liner if you really must. 
Um, I kind of hate Penn right now due to what I'm currently doing. Uh, I finished all the land of North America back in May, but due to three years of technical advancement, I'm now redrawing a vast section of the early stuff. <laughs> it just wasn't going to cut it. Um, so here's an example there. The process is about halfway through. I still have to take it to the Rocky Mountains. Because I overused pen early, I got stuck with bold, inked-in skylines that dated terribly. Um, now, not many hand-drawn works take this long, so that qualitative gulf isn't often so big. Uh, but it's big enough here that I've been scratching off pen with a knife at a large scale. So it goes something like this. Uh, I can't even watch this. <laughs> <laughs> the sound's not coming through, but it goes something like this. I mean, hours and hours and hours of the stuff. Um, and look, this is unfortunate, but I'll do what it takes to make the map whole. So again, that's the electric eraser there. Very handy. If you're using pen, be careful, but do know that errors can be corrected. However, it's great for labels, no doubt about that. They'll stand out boldly and make for fantastic font um, with using pen. Now, calligraphy is great, but I've mostly just used the tidy, tidy version of my own natural handwriting. Um, and look, a few carefully written labels does wonders for your handwriting. Everyone's personal font is unique, so it guarantees your map something unique if you use it. Uh, now, before moving on to some very different terrain, I just want to touch on projections. Uh, what is the best way to get an accurate, pencil, uh, accurate skeleton penciled in? How do you get your coastlines, rivers, roads, everything sketched faster and with more accuracy? Now, there are many ways to do this. Light boxes, carbon paper, gridding, but if you want freedom and interactivity while penciling in, I found no better approach than a digital projector. Whoop. It works great. Um, just like this one, wherever they are. Yeah, just like these. Um, on this commission here I drew in 2015, I drew a ranch deep in the mountains of northwest Arkansas. After the client marked and denoted all the features he wanted drawn, I found them and pinned them on Google Earth. Then, tilting it for an oblique angle, I projected it to the paper and sketched all the basics accurately. On this much more recent commission, I had to overlay three inset projections atop a world map. Um, now, each of these insets were filled with client-requested request, client sites of interest that I'd again marked off on Google Earth. Using a projector, I was able to get the fit just right and then turn features on and off depending on what I wanted to focus on as I sketched. Time to pencil in the freeways, turn on roads. Roads are getting in the way now, turn them off. Before I even began drawing, I had a full scaffolding on which to build an accurate map by hand. Now, with any creative product, there is a lot more contributing practically to its creation than the pure planning and technical execution. There is research, but more than that, there is the inspiration, the spark, the person or people that are making a product. What moves them? What moves you? I believe strongly that a map or any product is surely to benefit when inspired creators are engaging with their topic at multiple levels. Now for a cartographer mapping somewhere specific, it's likely that going to that place is a good idea. Uh, we can all imagine what somewhere else might be like, what it feels and looks like, but no amount of reading or street view can reveal the unique essence of place. Even if every piece of data you needed was available remotely, which, depending on the project, it probably is. The experience of traveling somewhere is so motivating. It invests you in the project holistically. It encourages that spark. When discussing the places on your map, you can talk about them from inside the place, a first-person perspective. But travel is often out of the question. If it's simply unnecessary or the region is far away or too broad, there's a chance you're not visiting anywhere. Same if you're mapping the craters of Mars, I'd say. So what can we do in our day-to-day -day lives to make contact with somewhere we're mapping? Can we fan that spark of inspiration even further just to see what happens? Now again, research and street view does not reveal the essence of place. What it is to be there, what it feels like, that starts with the senses. What does it taste, smell, look and sound like? What does it feel like? Uh, now there's no doubt that film, not excluded at all to just documentary, is a great place to start. What movies are set in your place? You might be focused on somewhere like New York or Chicago, spoiled for choice. Or perhaps it's remote and far away. Now, what movies get made there? When I was bogged down drawing the Arctic last year, I grew weary trying to make sense of trackless tundra from my Melbourne apartment. The experience of this place seemed like another planet, impossible to imagine. 
I didn't even know what to look for amongst the infinite frozen lakes of the tundra. But one memory kept coming to mind, a film that I'd watched years ago, Atanajuat, The Fast Runner. Uh, it is shot entirely in Nunavut, near the hamlet of Igloolik, a world away from anywhere most people have ever been. It retells centuries-old mythology with 90% of the cast and crew being Inuit. Rewatching this, it really struck me what a strong sense of place it has, spanning a few seasons and locations from dog sledding across thick sea ice to kayaking those same seas in a blinding polar summer. Uh, the muted crunch of snow underfoot was constant, while Inuit music, in particular throat singing, made for a powerful soundtrack. Watching Atanajuat gave me something to relate to, a window into the region I was mapping. Uh, so when I resumed the Arctic, uh, I was inspired, almost hearing snow crunching underfoot. Now sound is a most powerful sense, a major part of experiencing somewhere. Whether the sound of snow, ocean, bird song or busy traffic, a place is defined by its soundscape as much as anything else. Which brings me to music. Now, how wonderful it is that anywhere people have ever been, they've made music. From Igloolik to New Orleans, Salzburg to the Australian outback. It tells us about people and places in that universal language. Uh, now, listening to music from where you're mapping always sounded like a cool idea to me, but I'd never put much thought into it until, not long after watching Atanajuat, I finished the Arctic strip I was on to start the Caribbean, a real shift in latitude. Uh, I already knew how I was going to kick it off by watching a movie I'd also seen years ago, Buena Vista Social Club. And I remembered it for the same reason, that vivid sense of place, but for something else too. I remember it having spectacular music. Uh, I felt carried away to Cuba, just enchanted by its singular beauty. And above all, the music drew me in. I was spellbound. The sheer skill of every performer in that film is crazy enough, but the music was so rich and beautiful that I could not get enough. I rummaged through the discography of each member, tuned into Cuban radio stations. In my downtime, I read about rumba, son cubano, and the history of music on the island. It was all I listened to for weeks. Um, so it turned out that Son Cubano was for me, but everyone is different. You could be amazed by something else. Uh, you won't know if you don't dig, and regardless, it'll be fascinating. You might fall in love with what you find. Now, of course, it doesn't always go like this. Uh, I think Inuit throat singing is incredible, but after five hours listening to it, I found myself in a place that I wasn't quick to return to. <laughs> the point is that it's worth trying. You'll open a window into the character of a place while expanding your musical horizons. Uh, you may even fall in love with what you find. So with Cuba, I became obsessed with this idea of mapping like a method actor. How can you feel immersed in some faraway place? It seemed a wonderful thread to pull, pull but still I was missing the smell and taste, and I was 9,000 miles away in Australia. Uh, and Melbourne has incredible cuisine. If I was drawing Greece or Vietnam, I'd be covered. But its Caribbean offerings are limited. But still, dining on food from a region you're focused on sounds like a lot of fun. If you love to cook, you could pull up a recipe. If you live in a big, multicultural city, it could be a quick Google and a short subway ride away. Have fun with it. Uh, to celebrate my last session during Cuba, I went for the obvious choice, a cigar. I, I found a posh tobacconist in Melbourne and ended up spending a fortune on a single Monte Cristo. <laughs> It'd be the second cigar I'd ever had in my life, which I shouldn't have told the salesman, as he accused me of only wanting a Cuban cigar for the name and that a newbie like me would be better with something Dominican. When I explained that because of a big map I was drawing, it had to be Cuban, he just looked like I was, at me like I was crazy. <laughs> uh, as someone who barely knows how to smoke one, it was probably an unnecessary novelty, but it was the result of an idea I'm very passionate about. What can you learn, what inspiration can you foster by really digging deep on your place? Or your topic, I should add, I mean, you might be mapping an idea far more than you're mapping a place, Whatever it is, look closer. And most of all, have fun with it. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.